Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Glad to see you guys here this morning. You know, I didn't, I didn't know how many people would still be at home, you know, preparing their little snack for later tonight, but I'm glad you guys all made it. Um, we're going we're gonna to have communion this morning, um, and we're going to invite the kids to stay in the service and observe it with us as well. Um, a few announcements, though. First up is our Super Bowl party. Yeah, that's happening tonight, uh, right downstairs. Um, the, the doors open at 4.30 for that, so uh, bring your friends, bring your family, bring your food, bring your game. If you have a board game, maybe you're not as interested in the game, more interested in the commercials, so you have time for that. Um, but if you have a little board game you want to play with some people, feel free to bring that as well. Um, also, if you're able to help uh, set up for, for um, the tables and everything else that goes into that downstairs, uh, that begins at 3.30. And talk to Mark Miller or Rachel Miller, and they'll, they'll make sure they have enough hands to get that going. Um, but that's happening tonight, so we'll see you tonight at that. Uh, game kicks off at 5.30. Um, I won't be wearing either team. I like to, you know, be in between on this one, I think. Um, but feel free to wear your... Chiefs or Niners gear. Uh, next up, we have our ladies movie night. That's the movie Ever After. That's happening on February 16th. Uh, that starts at 6.30 right here in the church. So if you're a lady and you've got maybe uh, some intentions on going that, put that down in your calendar right there. And uh, if you have a friend, maybe also invite them. That would be a great way to just connect with other people. Um, we have our What's Your Story. Do you guys remember seeing that big banner right out there in the foyer out there? Well, it's new-ish again. Um, that's, uh, that's been revamped. Um, there's seven to nine minute um, new stories uh, on, on the What's Your Story app. Um, you can load it through the church app as well. Um, but uh, there's new stories on there. It's very, very more more interactive? I don't know how you say that. Um, because you can respond to other people's comments that they have on there. So maybe read through a couple of those and, and see if you've got um, something that connects with another person there. Um, but be sure to check that out as well. Uh, next up is our men's breakfast. All right, guys, we all know that some of our cholesterol is a little high, but we will enjoy the occasional sausage, bacon, eggs, you know, all that good stuff. Um, but that's happening on March 24th. We have a men's breakfast right here, March 24th at 8.30 a.m. So guys, put that down in your calendar as well. And then last but not least, we have our Prayer First Conference. That's uh, March 4th through the 6th. And uh, Converge Church has the opportunity to host that this year. Um, so we just want to get that on your guys' radar as well. Um, and then there will be more to come with that later on as the weeks go. Uh, and with that, Pastor Brian. Thank you, brother. All right. Let's see. Peggy and Alicia, good to see you. Um, we're glad you're here. And uh, an update on, on Greg is that he's at Madonna and uh, going through physical therapy, but continue to pray for his healing. And, and Linda and Andrea, good to see you back. I'm glad you've recovered. And, and Bud and Pat, good to see <laughs> Any others? <laughs> Any others? <laughs> it's just welcome. It's good to be here. Uh, we're going to go into a, a prayer time. And uh, we, we have three people this month that are going to be having surgery. Um, Crystal Johnson uh, on the, this Tuesday. Linda Boyle will be having surgery on her shoulder later this month. And then Bud Cook will also be having surgery uh, later this month as well. So we want to keep them uh, in mind. But before I pray, I want to turn our attention to Philippians chapter 4. And often we begin in verse 6 where it says, do not be anxious about anything. But I want to begin at the very end of verse 4 or verse 5 where it says, the Lord is at hand or the Lord is near. And with that in mind, we can go right into this. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, let's pray. Father, we do acknowledge that you are at hand, uh, that through your Holy Spirit you are near, and, and therefore we could freely worship you as we've been doing today, 
in the last few minutes, and we'll continue to do that. And we, can, we have full access to your throne room through prayer. And so, Father, you tell us that since you are near, that we're not to be anxious about anything. So, Father, whatever is, is causing worry, whatever is causing anxiety in our life right now, we just want to place it in your hands. We want to, we want to pray about it. We want to bring it to you as a supplication. We want, to, we want to bring it to you with thanksgiving. And so whatever we're going through right now, Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. We just put it into your hands, knowing that you're on the throne and that you're always working out your will and your plan for us uh, as we uh, go through this life. We thank you that you never abandon us. We thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us to our own strength that we can come to you uh, with our supplications, with thanksgiving, and then we can embrace a wonderful promise that your peace, a peace that will, uh, is beyond all comprehension, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for a wonderful promise, Father. Father, we want to pray for those who, who need uh, your healing touch. We, we lift up Greg Anderson, and Sue Ingram, Jan Johnson, uh, Ruth Apperson, Irene Rogers, Perla Rellis, uh, Jim Gaberson, Jen Sturkin, Linda Cummings, uh, Larry Harold, uh, Grace Royston, Bess Galloway, Jan Sturkin. Uh, we pray for Crystal and Linda and Bud as they be facing surgery later this month, Lord. We pray for your, your grace and your peace in each of their lives, Lord. We pray for family members, Lord, that you would strengthen faith and, and um encourage their hearts, Lord. We thank you for the fellowship of Converged Church where we know that we're not going through something alone, that we have our community group, we have our brothers and sisters in, in, in Christ. And, and so, Father, all glory and praise belongs to you that we are, are able to be part of such a wonderful fellowship, Lord. We, um, we think of the world stage now, Father, the situation in the Middle East. And uh, we pray, Lord, that there would be peace in Israel and Jerusalem and in the surrounding nations. And we know that only genuine peace is through the gospel. And so we pray that the gospel will spread there and also in Ukraine. We pray that this war will come to an end uh, as, as it's going into its third year. Uh, Father, we pray for our, our brother in our, our sister church in Ananya, Pastor Sasha, and, their, and the brothers and sisters in that church. We pray that you continue to strengthen them and encourage them, give them good health physically and spiritually, Lord, as they uh, continue to minister to uh, those that affect, are impacted by the war. And so, Father, we, we do pray for peace there. We, we thank you for this day, Lord. We, uh, we know that this is a day where millions and millions of people are, are going to be celebrating because of a football game uh, that's going to bring joy, perhaps, maybe some happiness to, in a kind of a superficial way uh, to people, but we know it's not an everlasting true joy that's only found in Jesus. And so, Lord, remind us as we continue to worship and as Pastor Mike comes up and preaches and as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that the main thing is the main thing, and that is our worship of you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Brian. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Isaiah again, Isaiah chapter 6. Israel is a flourishing tree under the hand of Yahweh that has been chopped down, or as we're in the progress of working our way through Isaiah, um, not yet in the book of Isaiah, but it has been chopped down, leaving only a stump. Nevertheless, the hope of the book of Isaiah is that there is a tender shoot. There is promise of life that will yet grow out of that stump to fulfill all of God's promises. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year King Uzziah died. In the year King Uzziah died, Uzziah as a king was powerful he was popular, and he was a godly king, despite violating God's command at the very tail end of his life and being chastened by God. And towards the end of his reign then, a dark shadow, I can't help but think, thinking of Lord of the Rings, and this dark shadow began to creep over the land. 
And so the people in Israel were still experiencing to a large degree the, the prosperity, the good times that they had gotten used to under Uzziah's reign. But they could see something. They could see something on the horizon and it didn't look good. And it was fearful for many of them. It began to look like the days of prosperity were over. And parents were wondering what kind of world their children would grow up in. From your own experience, you can imagine that Isaiah, as well as other faithful, were wondering, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? It's not like Isaiah could just stroll into the most holy place of the temple and ask a few questions. Anybody here seen God? Where is He? Can you show us? But God blessed him with a vision, didn't He? Isaiah chapter 6. God blessed him with a vision that was so much greater even than Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. A vision of the temple, actual temple, the eternal house of God in the heavens. And what Isaiah discovered was there is no vacant throne. The throne is occupied just as it always has been by the great God of the universe. In fact, what he learned was that God is greater than he ever imagined. And that's significant, that God was greater than he ever had imagined. In the Second World War, there was a young Anglican minister, and uh, along with virtually every other Londoner, he was driven down into places of shelter during the, the London Blitz when all the bombings were taking place. And when he was down there, he had time to think about his ministry, and he, he recollected the fact that the young people just couldn't understand their King James Version Bibles. They were frustrated with the language there, and it didn't seem relevant to them. And so he began, while he was actually in the bomb shelters, began translating a new version of the New Testament, uh, one that we now call the Phillips Translation of the New Testament. Uh, in 1953, this same J.B. Phillips, who translated the New Testament, he wrote this book, Your God is Too Small. Your God is Too Small. And what he wrote 70 years ago is still just as relevant today. I would encourage you, uh, if you've never seen that book, you can just Google it, right? You Google everything. Google it. You can find a PDF online of the whole book since it's old enough now. Uh, so look for that online. I think you'll find it very helpful. He writes in the book, No one is ever really at ease in facing what we call life and death without a religious faith. Listen now. The trouble with many people today is that they have not found a God big enough for modern needs. While their experience of life has grown in a score of different directions and their mental horizons have been expanded to the point of bewilderment by world events and by scientific discoveries, mind you, 1953, their ideas of God have remained largely static. See what he's saying? Everything else has blown up to immeasurable proportions. And God's still just like this. He goes on. It is, uh, this is so powerful. Please let it sink in. It is obviously impossible for an adult to worship the conception of God that exists in the mind of a child of Sunday school age unless he is prepared to deny his own experience of life. If by a great effort of will he does do this, he will always be secretly afraid lest some new truth may expose the juvenility of his faith. And it will always be by such an effort that he either worships or serves a God who is really too small to command his adult loyalty and cooperation. Oh, that penetrates deep, doesn't it? Our conception of God which will always be somewhat less than the actual reality of the greatness of God, nevertheless must continue to grow 
or we'll find ourselves in a struggle that he doesn't meet the needs of our modern world. That's what Isaiah discovered. God, Israel's God was, in a sense, literally God in a box. We've got a picture up there. The most holy place where the ark was housed was a perfect cube. <laughs> 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. So I don't know if J.B. Phillips had that in his mind when he wrote, Your God is too small. But the God of Israel, if conceived to be contained in the temple, was literally in a 20 cubit cube. I seriously doubt that any of Isaiah's contemporaries thought that God was stuck there or that the temple could contain him in any sense, and yet they had to be vulnerable to the same, same temptation that we are. If they were human like we are, they had to be susceptible to the same temptation, the temptation to doubt that God is big enough for our modern needs. Chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6. It's at the end of this one to six chapter thumbnail that I have described. I think all of the elements um, in, their, in their elemental form from throughout all of Isaiah are contained in these first six chapters. It prefigures what will be detailed in the latter half of the book and answers the question, how will Israel get from doom think the woes of chapter 5, to destiny, think the promise of chapter 2. In 2.5, the prophet appeals to them, O oh, house of Jacob, come, let's walk in the light of the Lord. But they refuse to do so. In chapter 5, Isaiah concludes, if one looks to the land, behold, darkness, distress, and the light is darkened by its clouds. If we don't wake up to God's promises and warnings so that darkness descends on us, what's the remedy then? What's the remedy then? Isaiah answers, God answers with the vision of chapter 6, only a radical act of God's grace can awaken us to the reality and our responsibility to God. So we read in 6, 1 to 4, we'll repeat what Brian has already read, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of Him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. Here we learn, and Isaiah witnesses, the evidence that God's dominion in the world is absolute absolute. Through this vision, Isaiah is um, gained a stunning new apprehension of God, and, I, and, and I, I like the word apprehension. It seems to fit here perfectly. Apprehension, of course, can mean simply uh, an intellectual grasp of something, but it also, we use it to talk about something that's a little fearful, right? And both are perfect for this setting. He sees it, he grasps it, he acknowledged it, but he also has to shrink back because of the holiness of God. Notice these elements with me, if you would. The vision is of the Lord on a high throne. A high throne. We have to think authority, don't we? And that's who's on the high throne. There may be many. There may be multitudes of thrones. The highest one is the one who has the highest authority. The one who sits on the throne has a robe and I believe that that robe symbolizes his conquest. That robe that Isaiah describes fills the temple, doesn't it? It fills. In fact, to be more specific, it's the train of the robe. 
The train refers to um, it, below the waist. We'll, we'll get into this deeper, but it's definitely below the waist. So, you know, I, you're picturing it in your mind, I'm picturing it in my mind, but the fact is just the lower portion of that robe is engulfing the temple with glory. Now, I don't know if it's truly this way because he doesn't, he doesn't make it any more clear for us, but does that mean that if the lower portion of his robe is filling the temple, that he's seated so high that he's above <laughs> the whole temple where he's supposed to be contained within the cube? I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that the very bottom portion of the robe is filling the temple. A historical note here. Assyria was the rising threat in the world of the day. It was the up-and-coming superpower of that day. And when Shalmaneser V of Assyria defeated a nation, we know this from inscriptions, he would take that king's robe and he would have it sewn into his own so that as he conquered nations, his robe got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You can imagine uh, if uh, our, our memorial stadium down there, um, instead of being filled with flags that designated champions and retired numbers, what we had was all these grass-stained, torn jerseys of other teams plastered on the walls, right? We're saying we have dominated. And I believe that that's a portion of what is symbolized here, that his throne is expansing and it's filling the temple with glory because it shows his authority over all nations. There's no one who is not subject to this king's authority. We move on. Uh, what we note that the Lord's conquest cannot be contained by the temple in Jerusalem. It goes far beyond. There is thunderous worship by angels who tell of his worldwide fame. The whole earth is, that's reinforcing the robe idea, right? The whole earth is filled with his glory. Um, these seraphim, seraphim, that ending I am at the end, that's plural, so a singular is a seraph, and plural is seraphim. So you have seraphim attending this ceremony. Um, I like images, artwork that's done, um, usually I like very realistic artwork, but when it comes to depicting seraphim, give me the more modern. Uh, if you look up, you can find artwork, you know, just, you know, just Google images, seraphim, more modern ones because it tries to display just the, the blur, the light, the motion. There's, it's, it's not trying to put down details. It's, it captures the wonder. So I enjoy looking at those and I prefer them. And then smoke. Smoke adds to the mystery, the, the thundering voices shaking the pillars. All of us tells us that this is unapproachable, that you, you can see it, you can observe it, but it is absolutely out of touch and unapproachable. A.W. Tozier reminds us, we must not think of God as highest in an ascending order of things starting with a single cell and going up from the fish to the bird to the animal to man to angel to cherub to God, God is as high above an archangel as above a caterpillar. For the gulf that separates the archangel from the caterpillar is finite, while the gulf between God and the archangel is infinite. It's totally beyond our capability of fully understanding. Now, I want to note a couple of things here. The first thing I want to note for you is what G, that what Isaiah sees in this vision is a vision of Jesus. Jesus, pre-incarnate vision of the second member of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 12, John chapter 12, uh, verse 39 uh, John is commenting, therefore they could not believe, for again, Isaiah said, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 here, portion just past ours for the morning. He's quoting, and he says, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest, what they, see, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So there's a quote from Isaiah 6, and then John adds 41, Isaiah said these things, 
because he saw his, Jesus' glory, and spoke of him. He saw Jesus enthroned in the temple in the manner that we have just described. Then I want to observe by way of application that this Jesus that, you, that Isaiah sees is not subject to kingly successions. I think that's the point of the historical note that starts Isaiah chapter 6. It's a time of turmoil and uncertainty for the people of Israel because their good and godly and powerful king is fading off the scene. But God does not give him a vision assuring Isaiah that Uzziah's son was more than capable of putting things straight. You following me? It does not matter, or it was not the assurance to the nation that a fearful glance around was unfounded, that there really was nothing out there going on that was be too big for Judah and Jerusalem. The point for us is that this Jesus that Isaiah describes is not subject to election results. Who our next president will be matters in some sense. Get the vote out. <laughs> Go vote by all means. We have that privilege, that responsibility in our nation. It matters in some sense, but it does not matter in the sense of God's rule over human history and His plan of redemption for mankind. In that sense, God is on the throne that has not changed. That's encouraging to me. God's dominion is absolute, and secondly, the grasp of His dominion is both necessary and humbling for us. It's necessary for us, and it's humbling. Verse 5, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost. Isaiah, woe is me. Uh, that was used in chapter 5, remember, a woe against the nation. Now he's applying it to himself. Oh, no, woe is me. I am lost. I'm destroyed. I'm doomed is what that word conveys. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, Isaiah's new grasp of God's holiness led to a catastrophic awareness of sin. He has been fine up to this point in his life. He's been fine with God contained and a certain amount of ritual between him and God. I perform the appropriate ritual that God has given me and that allows me to be in the walk the walk that I walk and conceive of the God I conceive of. But all of that has changed. God has now exploded out of the box and Isaiah realizes nobody is safe. Nobody's safe if that's what God is like. Holy, holy, holy. There's a single word here that reflects the authenticity of Isaiah's confession, and perhaps it points out the hollowness of our confessions sometimes. It's the most innocuous little word in the whole verse. It's and. It's and. Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell with people of unclean lips. He says, I'm unworthy, we're all unworthy. And I'm afraid that too often what runs through our minds is something more like, I am a man of unclean lips, but fortunately, my lips are not as unclean as the lips of the people in my community group. <laughs> my lips are not as unclean as others who are around me. I have unclean lips, but. But the sincerity, I believe, of Isaiah's confession comes through that he doesn't distance himself from anybody. Anybody at all. So, God's condemnation is about to fall on Israel. And Isaiah says, yeah, that's me. That's me. 
He identifies with the nation, and he says, we are doomed. We're lost. Good people, we are most blessed who have been ruined by the holiness of God because the ruining of our pride is the beginning of God's grace. You and I are most blessed who have been ruined by a vision of the true God because that ruination of our pride is the beginning of God's grace. The gospel presentation that I like best goes like this. Has anyone ever taken a Bible and shown you how you can know for sure that you have eternal life? The Bible contains both bad news and good news. The bad news is something about you. The good news is something about God. Can we start with the bad news? That's exactly how it reads. Can we start with the bad news? And Isaiah has just gotten the bad news, hasn't he? That God's perfection demands an answer for sin, and no man stands under that scrutiny. Well, that's not the end of the story, is it? God's atoning work is alone sufficient, but abundantly available to absolve our guilt and qualify us to serve. So the vision goes on, verse 6, then one of the seraphim flew to me. See, here's what, here's, up to this point, it just looks like he's been seeing it. And now all of a sudden, 3D, right? Oh, it's flying to me. And having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and he said, behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Now with this introduction of the burning coal and an altar, we have to reconsider our previous image. Isaiah said he saw a throne that was high and lifted up. He saw a kingly robe that was so magnificent that it filled the temple with glory. And then he said, I am undone because I've seen the king, the Lord of armies, Yahweh of armies, and it's over for me, right? It's all been in terms of kingship. But something happens here. The seraph takes a coal from the altar with tongs. If you remember with me, uh, the vision of the map of the, the temple and even of the tabernacle before it, you know that there was two altars, right? There was an altar in the courtyard where the sacrifices took place, the large main altar. But then inside the holy places, there was another altar, a smaller one, that was for the burning of incense. And this word here for tongs is only ever used in the Old Testament for tongs that were used at the altar of incense. So it would appear that in Isaiah's vision, this seraph has used the tongs of the altar of incense from the Holy of Holies and brought that to touch his lips. Again, our, our sense is that in the vision, the temple has been opened up. The temple has been opened up, and and, and Isaiah is in there where he ain't supposed to be. And he, he must have thought for sure after he said, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm doomed. Well, here comes the agent of destruction right now. Why? Because King Uzziah. In the year that King Uzziah died, what happened to King Uzziah? Why was he chastened by God? Because as a king, he usurped the authority of a priest and he went into the holy place and he tried to minister at the altar of incense. And so, now we suddenly are thinking, we rethink, okay, I had king before, now I'm getting this priest vibe. 
And, and I'm also remembering that other places in the Old Testament where it talks about the robe, and especially the Hebrew word shul, the hem of the robe, it was talking about the robe of the priests that had the pomegranate sewn down there and all that lovely embroidery that was at the hem of the priest's robe. And, and so I was all caught up and I was settled and I was satisfied with the vision of the great king of the universe sitting on his throne, high and exalted, dominating wherever he goes, and now I'm seeing a priest. Now, now I'm seeing a priest and I'm into the temple and I'm being ministered to and my sins are being cleansed by a priestly action of the very king that I had seen before. A priest and a king. This firestorm of divine judgment turned out to be an act of God's atoning grace. Now, where else have you seen a firestorm of God's judgment that becomes an atoning place of God's grace? Of course, you know where. As we finish up and think about how we should um, make sure we integrate this truth into our lives, I want to take you back to uh, J.B. Phillips' book. I'll give you a quick outline here. In his book, Your God is Too Small, he lists these two small gods. I, I can't help but see the, the, the gesture in basketball now is this, right? You know, you make a play and you gesture that your opponent is too small, right? Uh, here's your too small God. I, I wonder if any of these sound familiar to you. There is the resident policeman, too small. The parental hangover, too small. The grand old man, too small. Meek and mild, too small. Absolute perfection. You might want to read that chapter. Huh, too small. Heavenly bosom, oh, too small. Got in a box, too small. Managing director, secondhand God, perennial grievance, oof. Pale Galilean, <laughs> Projected image, all of them, too small. They don't do God justice. All of them too small. So what are we to do? What are we to do? Well, we submit to God's grace. Phillips writes again, it's not our intention to build up merely a bigger and better God who may be just as much an artificiality as any of the unattractive galaxy we have discarded what we're going to try to do is open the windows of the mind and the heart, to put it crudely, to enlarge the aperture through which the light of the true God may shine. If a man lives in a light-proof room, the sun may shine in dazzling splendor, and the man himself will know nothing of it. He may light himself a candle, or he may bore a hole in his prison. In the first case... He can never have more than an artificial glimmer, and in a second, he will only get a tiny glimpse of real daylight. Some of the gods we have considered are nothing more than artificial. Some of them are inadequate pinhole glimpses of the true light. What we're going to try to do then is not light a fresh candle, but take down the shutters. There is no reason why we should be content with the candle or the pinhole if a little determined thinking and a little sincere action and all the grace of God will remove the shutters. As we consider this passage, I hope that what will linger with us is the absolute holiness, the separateness, the incomprehensible glory of God. And then that we'll delight in the fact that there's any way at all that we can have fellowship, and it's one way. It's through Jesus. Uh, the smoke shaking pillars of the temple. Those, temp those, those pillars were magnificent, right? You remember what their names were? Oh, trivia question for the community group. The names of the pillars, they were named. That's how significant they were. Named the pillars of the, They were shaking. 
They were shaking. And all of this gives us the impression that you're forbidden to come any closer. Not for us. Not for us because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus says to us, come. Come to the table. It's all been taken care of. Brian, will you come lead us in communion? Help pass out the elements. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. We're about to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and as Pastor Mike rightly pointed out, that we have access to come to the table because of the blood of Jesus. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you are, you are welcome to celebrate. Of course, today is Super Bowl 58. Millions of people will be yelling and cheering uh, later today. Uh, when touchdowns are scored, there will be celebration throughout the nation and the world. Uh, when the game is over, uh, winners declared, millions of people will celebrate uh, throughout the night and beyond. Uh, imagine the honking of horns, uh, the fireworks, tears of joy either in Kansas City or San Francisco after the game. I'm certainly not against celebrating when your favorite team wins at all. Uh, in my lifetime, my favorite baseball team, the Boston Red Sox, have won the World Series four times. My favorite football team, the Pittsburgh Steelers, have won the Super Bowl six times. Did each of those wins make me happy? Yeah. Did, did they produce joy? Well, yeah, a little bit of joy. Uh, did those wins produce everlasting joy? Absolutely not. Not, not even close. True and everlasting joy is only produced through our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said to his disciples and to us, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him. It is he that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. We abide in Christ through trust, through prayer, through our obedience, and as we continually nurture our relationship with Jesus, we're going to bear much fruit. That is spiritual fruit with eternal value. Our words, our, our actions can have an eternal impact on the people around us. And as we love and obey Jesus, joy, true joy, will be one of the results. A few verses later, in that same chapter, John 15, verse 11, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. So that great joy of Jesus can be our complete joy, a joy that will last any joy that this world produces. So let's joyfully come to the Lord's table. Let's celebrate the supreme and ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins. The, the, the bread and the cup, they, they point us to the cross. They, uh, where the innocent, sinless Jesus died in our place and he absorbed the wrath of God which we deserve. He died, he was buried, and three days later he was raised from the dead through the power of God. Uh, our sins separate us from a holy God, but Jesus paid the price with his life and blood. Let's take the bread. Uh, it symbolizes the body of Christ that was sacrificed for us. Let us eat this bread together in remembrance of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your supreme love towards us that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die in our place that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's take the cup. Symbolizes the shed blood of Jesus. Let's drink this in remembrance of him. And Father, as we reflect on the, the sacrifice of your son, we pray that we will continue to nurture our relationship with him through trust, faith, prayer, and worship, fellowship with God's people. 
Uh, we thank you for this, this time, this few moments we had to remember and celebrate the death of your son Jesus in our place. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for those uh, online who may have tuned in uh, via that, that mode. Uh, appreciate having you all together to consider God's Word together. What we like to do is to turn commentary into conversation. So I hope you have enjoyed to some, in some way the commentary that I've given on Isaiah. Probably just as important, maybe more, is conversation that comes out of this as you process what you've heard and have a chance to talk about it with someone else. So our regular policy is that uh, 10 to 15 minutes after the service, we go to our community groups. And if you're not part of one of those, we'd love to have you participate just to get that word to sink a little bit deeper into your understanding. If you're not here with us today in person, you can send questions to uh, mike at convergechurchomaha.org, and I'd love to interact with you uh, that way, uh, answer questions, and, and just get the conversation going. So please feel free. Uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time today, uh, so delighted that you've been with us. Hope you've uh, felt comfortable and welcomed here. There is a little pad under some of those chairs, and we would love to get your contact information. If you would fill that out and drop it in one of the offering boxes that's out in the foyer, that would help us to relate to you a little bit better. Let's stand together, shall we? Hey, we've got a reason to celebrate. Let's, let's celebrate this everlasting God.